The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all, them all, and it did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Good morning, and I want to <clears throat> I want a special shout out to those on on live stream every 9 a.m. mass. Just wishing them good morning. The past two Sundays, a parishioner of ours, a young man, young adult, <clears throat> came out and he said to me, "Father, I want you to, I want you to know that my my girlfriend was here for a month, and now she's back in her country, and she watches live stream every Sunday at nine. She's back in her country, and actually for her, it's 9 p.m. So she's in Japan. So to the young lady in Japan, konnichiwa. Uh, Welcome, the Holy Spirit can traverse land, sea, sky, the universe, and use technology to reach our hearts. So I hope your heart's touched in a special way and just know that you're loved and everyone over in Japan is loved. God bless you. I think it's important to acknowledge that we, we, we come together and our Lord, our Lord knows humanity. As he closed in the living word of God that speaks to us today of life, he said he didn't need anybody to tell him. He knew, he knew human nature. So he knows, he knows our hearts. And he's known the hearts of people for all time. And he knows what's good for our hearts. What's good for our hearts. In order for our hearts to be just and righteous. Justin Rice is in the eyes of our Lord. Our Lord wants to lead us in the way that are just, the ways that are righteous, because it's good for our hearts. I'm willing to bet that the vast majority, if not all of you, have experienced in your life maybe a moment where you have been the recipient of some form of injustice. Or, if we're all honest in different ways, if we look, probably moments in which we have been unjust to others. Justice truly means defined rendering another their due. What their due, what God knows what their due. What their due, what, how we should treat our, na- our neighbor, the great commandment to love the Lord God with your whole heart, soul, mind, strength in your neighbor as yourself, to render them their due justice. Every single human being created in the image and likeness of God, independent of what they can produce or do, or what they've done or failed to do, has a dignity. 
What is the dignity of the human person? The Catechism of Catholic Church tells us very clearly that the dignity of every single human being is this, very simply. The dignity of all human people is that they are called, all of us are called, to communion with God. It's intrinsic, something given to us by God, not extrinsic, given to us by where we live or what we have or who we are. That's why Jesus says, I was in prison and you visited me. Someone who maybe even has done horrible crimes, they still, that dignity is there and they're called to communion with God. Called to communion with God. So little ones for injustice, what I mean, and maybe you've experienced it. You can see it at times on a playground. You learn how to share. When you go to a playground and you see where someone is not sharing and it causes strife. Or when you see in some way, shape, or form a misguided understanding that if I in some way, shape, or form put this person down, it will elevate me in the eyes of others, right? In the sense of like, picking on someone or, or, or making someone just an object of, of, of some kind of treatment that is unjust. It's a do they do not deserve, right? And so to render the other their due, let them on the swing. Follow the rules in the games. Nobody likes to call themselves out for a foul. We're getting ready for obviously March Madness, basketball, everybody gets together. There's a different types of March madness and it's the madness of March in which Jesus Christ is madly in love for all humanity, that March madness. But when you watch the basketball, you'll see someone foul and they have the instant replay and they're like, oh yeah, he hit, it. He, he hit that guy's arm big time. It's like, I didn't do anything, right? Nobody likes to call themselves out on a foul. But the just thing, which is hard to say, you know what, I fouled. Call your own foul in that way. I had experience when I was working in corporate America, and this is maybe more in line for those of you who are working in the corporate world. I can't imagine what the corporate world could be like. I'm sure there's challenges. There's challenges in life. I know I just, at that time, I got out of the uh, military. I was 27 years old. It was 1997, and I was working as an IT project manager uh, in a company right outside of New York City. And it was in the time of the Y2K. Right? Everybody knows. Look, everybody starts laughing about the Y2K. And I was part of the Y2K project working IT, and we were getting all set up for that. Well, we had a meeting where we were going to change over the data center where the mainframes were. And now I'm talking the language of those who are a little older now. The mainframes and switch them out for the routers and the switches and the hubs and all that stuff for the new technology for those, that big thing that was coming about called the wide area network, right? All that stuff we were doing. I didn't know much about it, but I was in charge with a job to be the project team leader to get the team together to work as a team to accomplish the project. There was a day in which we had called some vendors to come over from New York City and we were gonna have a meeting. And a manager who I depended on to be at that meeting to give guidance to the called me into his office because I needed him to be part of it and others and said, you need to tell so-and-so who works in the data center area that we're not having a meeting. I don't want him at that meeting. I was like, excuse me? He said, I don't want him at the meeting. Go tell him that we're not having a meeting. And so for me, something they taught me in the military, if you were asked to do something that was unethical, not just, the best thing to do was to ask the question back to them. So I looked at him and I said, let me get this straight. What you're asking me to do is to call this person who's scheduled to be at this meeting and tell them we're not having a meeting when actually what is happening is we are having a meeting? And he goes, yes. I said, I'm not gonna do that. You can do that. And he goes, I'm not gonna do that. Give me the phone. I'm gonna call the vendors and tell them that we're not having the meeting. I'm gonna cancel the meeting on the vendors. I said, they're halfway through the Lincoln Tunnel. You're gonna ruin their day. So it was a moment of tension. It was really kind of tough. And he got, he got really mad at me and all this stuff. I'm like, man. So that was an experience at 27 and the idea of not working as a team and a sense of injustice, 
Now for me, I forgive that gentleman. And I, 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 you know, I, I, I do. I'm not talking so much about myself, but, we're, but in the sense of forgiving, we pray that prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But that was a hard moment. So what did I do? I went to his boss and my boss. We have the same boss. And I told him the scenario. I said, I don't think this is just. A couple days later, calls me into his, in the office and says, sit down, shut the door. If you ever do that to me again, I will crush you. I will bury you. And at 27, I was totally intimidated by someone about twice my age. And I just kind of looked at him and smiled and I said, I'm okay with that. I'm not from New York City. I'd rather move back to Georgia. It was kind of easy for me in a way. Go ahead, crush and bury me. I'll just get a job in Georgia, right? And I have nothing to lose. I didn't have my family. I didn't have all that stuff. I didn't have, it was just me and, you know, things I wanted to do. But, but that was a moment where, where I kind of felt a certain degree of injustice. But to call myself out, and, and my parents are on live stream too. They're like, oh yeah, but Richard, when you grew up, you weren't always just with your brothers and sisters, right? So we've all kind of had that moment. And what do we see in the gospel today? We see the just one the just one who is truth incarnate, <clears throat> who hung on the cross for you, me, and all humanity. And it wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. It was his love. And he was trying to love humanity into the truth. We see the just one coming to the temple and seeing the injustice of what was going on. The weighing of the scales. Maybe even remember when he was 12 and he went to the temple at 12 and saw his foster father, St. Joseph, ripped off on the scale when they went to do their offerings. Jesus saw the heart of the humanity and the injustice going on, and he challenged them. What sign are you gonna give for what you've just done? And he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the scripture tells us, John tells us, because they learned later, haven't heard that, that he meant the temple of his body. Lift me up, lift me up, destroy this temple and I will raise it, the resurrection. In a moment, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in mass, as we enter into the Eucharistic prayer, after the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the continuation of God's love story with us. We're part of that. We are his body. He is the head. And the mass is a conversation between the son and the father with the Holy Spirit, and we're part of that conversation. And in a moment, and I want y'all to repeat back with me because I know you know what to say, but I want to talk about it and explain a little the why. In a moment in the Eucharist, after that prayer, as we enter into that prayer, I will say to you, the Lord be with you. And you will respond. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. And then the priests continue. It is always right and just and good to honor and to glorify, to give thanks what we're doing right now is right and just. Rendering thanks to God, but it's good for us to be here. Our hearts, our hearts are temples. I'm holding this book here because I'm gonna, for the rest of the homily, I'm gonna read you the whole book, okay? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that to you. I'm gonna go to one part. And what I'm gonna talk about is that we lift our hearts up to the Lord. What are our hearts? Every single heart is created by God. Every single heart has the potential to be a temple of the Holy Spirit after baptism. I'm gonna to talk to you briefly and read this prayer about in the rite of baptism, before a baby is baptized, the heart is anointed with the oils, the oil of catechumen, and the priest or the bishop or the deacon prays this prayer. Almighty, ever-living God, 
who sent your son into the world to drive out from us the power of Satan, the spirit of evil, and bring the human race rescued from darkness into the marvelous kingdom of your light. We humbly beseech you to free these children from original sin, to make them the temple of your glory, and to grant that your Holy Spirit may dwell in them through Christ our Lord. Temple of your glory, of God's glory. My brothers and sisters in Christ, by virtue of our baptism, we are temples. We are temples. If you've ever been to the blessing of a new church or a cathedral or a basilica, the bishop takes the oils that are blessed and the first thing that he blesses is the entrance, the door outside. Then he comes into the temple, the church, and blesses everything else. And the last thing he blesses is the altar. He pours the oil all over the altar, all over that. Blessing that sanctuary, this sanctuary, this place. But there's something greater here. Obviously, our Lord in the Eucharist, our Lord who speaks to us, but also you and me, by virtue of our baptism, we are one body with Christ. Our temples. How am I preparing my temple for Easter, for the coming days? For those of us who profess the Catholic faith and we will pray the creed, profess it, the ordinary means that God wants to use because he wants us to hear through the priests who need to go to confession too. He wants us to hear his words, I absolve you, I absolve you. And so confession is not anything to be, be afraid of. It's an it's a ordinary means that Jesus has given his church through the sacraments to receive that pardon and not only receive that pardon, but to hear it in the words of the absolution in our heart, to go forth with that peace, to know I've been forgiven. I absolve you. It's the ordinary means. For a Catholic, the church asks us one time a year is the low bar. One time a year to go to confession. Once a year. During this, this season of conversion. To return to the Lord with all our hearts. To render him what is just, just and what, what is right. I give you my heart. If there's any darkness in any way, shape, or form, bring your light into my heart. I give you these corners of my heart and maybe what I'm holding back for any fear, I give it to you, Lord. Bring your light into that. Bring your peace. Bring your joy. He wants to. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the close. This is the bow on the end of it. And it's coming as a gift. And I truly believe that Jesus, for you and for me, wants all of us to know that he loves us and he wants to encounter us in that sacrament of healing. If it's been many years, do not be afraid. The priests are excited about the moment to be able to see God's mercy work in your heart. It's not the number of years. Our God is the God of the present. In the bulletins, you'll see examination and conscience, different things to do. Make a resolution. If you haven't already, how might I go knowing that my heart is a temple and prepare my temple for the Lord so that I can bring his goodness and his peace and his love and his joy to the world. Let us return to the Lord with all our hearts.